Aloha, good morning, happy Wednesday to all of you. Thank you already for starting to write in some questions. We welcome all of your questions here on Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. And today, Ryan, we are going straight to the source. We're going to be asking the doctor. That's why we have a doctor in the house, someone who has joined the program in the past and brought some insightful thoughts about what's happening with COVID-19 and the vaccination process. Joining us from Hawaii Pacific Health is Dr. Belinda Ashton. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashton, for being a part of our show this morning. Hey, good morning. Uh, let's first start off with where we're at with the vaccine. We know that Hawaii Pacific Health has been sort of taking the lead in this area, setting up that vaccination center that was opened at Pier 2. How are things looking right now with the overall vaccination process and what are some of the numbers and, and what you're seeing right now? Yeah, so at um, Hawaii Pacific Health, we've now given, I think it's 219,000 doses of vaccine in all of our various um, sites. So starting off with our employees in December and then moving into Pier 2 in January and then most recently um, our vaccine bus that we've been taking to the Department of Education high schools and, and actually some private high schools as well. So um, it's been going really well. We've been busy over all these months, but of course we're seeing what everybody else is seeing. The, the number of folks who still are coming in to get vaccinated has dropped. And so particularly at Pier 2, for example, we're doing several hundred a day rather than our preferred 2,000 a day. Um, but you know, several hundred a day is still worthwhile. How much longer do you think that facility will be needed? Um, we're constantly looking at that um, to try to determine when we will shut it down and, and when we shut it down, where will we be available for folks who still need second doses, for example, or, or you know, that kind of thing. Um, I think we're going to be there certainly throughout June. We're making a few follow-up appointments in early July, and then we're, we're reassessing. The um, ship that uh, docks there is currently gone to dry dock, and so we're expecting that one back in a few weeks. And we think that might be um, a marker for when it's time for us to move out of the Pier 2 space. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd mentioned that vaccination bus. I'm wondering if you can share a little more about what exactly that is. We, we see this large blue bus uh, that is driving around town for so yeah. those of you who've seen it in action. Uh, explain what the mission and the overall goal and objective of that really is. Right. Well, we had known for several months that we wanted to take the vaccination program to several of the high schools where we have a medical assistant training program. So Waipahu High School, um, Campbell, Farrington, Kapolei, um, there, there are a number of high schools on the island that are participating in health academies. And so we have some of their students who are training with us as medical assistants. Those, those students have been giving shots and doing other work at Pier 2, and we thought it would be really fun before graduation to take them back to their own high schools and let them, you know, vaccinate their colleagues, their peers. And, and so that was already in the plan. And then as we began to think about it, and we were seeing the drop off in interest in the mass vaccination centers, we thought it might make sense to take the vaccine much closer to the community. And we know that schools are a trusted partner and, and a familiar place in a community. And so it all kind of coalesced into this idea of if we got a bus, we could take all of our equipment, all of our people and safely transport the vaccine, keep it refrigerated at, at the appropriate temperatures and so forth, and then go mobile. And so that's what we've done. Um, and we've been now to, I think it's 16 or 17 different high schools and we're on our second round. So we're running back around to do the second doses now three weeks later. So we've got the entire month of June full of sites to go to. Some of the middle schools are stepping up as well after the 12 to 15 year olds were approved. So um, we're keeping ourselves busy and we're doing several hundred doses a day at each of those locations as well. Let's talk about those uh, 12 plus. What kind of a reaction do you see with them? Uh, are any of their symptoms or reactions to the vaccine different? Uh, and what are you hearing in terms of participation there? Are they as likely or are they more likely perhaps to uh, receive the vaccine compared to those over the age of 18? Yeah, we've actually seen some real excitement. When the 12 to 15 year olds were approved, um, there was a flurry of interest and a lot of parents and kids came to our sites, both the um, high schools and Pier 2. Um, and in many cases, the kids talked their parents into getting a shot at the same time, which was interesting and fun to see. Um, as far as side effects, nothing really different. We have known as, as pediatricians, we know that um, 
sometimes adolescents, when they get a shot, are more likely to faint. So we've seen more fainting, but we manage that, and that's not a big uh, worry. Um, and it's not that common, but it just happens. And um, apart from that, we're expecting to see and seeing the same side effects, sore arm, maybe feeling a bit tired, and actually probably less side effects than in some of the uh, middle-aged to older adults. Let's talk about the next demographic or the next age range, I should say, of those individuals who will qualify uh, or, or be cleared, I guess, to get the vaccine. Uh, what do you foresee and when do you foresee that happening? And what is the status right now of where we're at with, with those next, uh, the next in line? Right. So I understand that Pfizer, the vaccine that makes the um, that makes the one that is currently approved for 12 to 15 year olds has um, applied or plans to apply to the FDA for authorization for the two to 12 year olds. So um, I know they're also studying from six months to two, but my understanding is that the data that they're going to submit to the FDA next will be for the two to 12 year old age group. And they have announced that that's likely to happen in September. So for parents who are trying to decide whether or not that's appropriate for their child, what are some factors that you would recommend they look into? Of course, talk to their doctor, but you know, are there some specific medical conditions or you know, what, what, what do parents need to be have, talking about when they do approach their physician? Right. So, you know, the kind of the word on the street is that kids don't get sick with COVID. And so um, people, parents are, are commonly not very worried about the illness. Now, there is a, a rare condition that is happening among children. And so I wouldn't completely discount the risk of the COVID infection. But I think more important for many families is um, they want their kids protected to protect others. And that's important. But also, you know, if your kid is on, say, a soccer team and they're planning to go to the state tournament and now they have to be tested to travel to one of the other islands to, to do that, if one of your teammates tests positive, that might interfere with the entire team going uh, on that tournament. Or if you wanted to travel to the mainland for a wedding or a something else and, and you're worried about that you know, coming back test and you don't wanna have to stay on the mainland for 10 days because you're a child who could have been vaccinated tested positive. Doing the vaccination stops some of those interruptions in, in your world as you are dealing with the vac you know, the virus is still circulating. So unvaccinated folks are still at risk. You know, you of course are, have a pediatrician as a as background and you've de dealt with uh, children in, in your practice. H have you heard or any of the discussions that you're having with parents? Is there that hesit hesitancy that's still there? What are you, I guess, just hearing on the ground there? Uh, from what parents are saying, is it something that they're looking forward to maybe having that opportunity to give, say, their seven-year-old uh, the opportunity to get the vaccine? Yeah, I, I think um, many parents are really looking forward to it. Um, and there are still those who feel like, yeah, it's not that big a deal. It's not that the disease is not that big a worry. Um, we do know that children often don't get very sick. They often don't pass it to each other. You know, in school situations, we're not all that worried about them passing it to each other. But I heard of one circumstance where a three-year-old in preschool um, took the, the virus home to uh, his or her mother, and then the mother got sick, and the mother then infected an older adult in the household, both of whom had chosen not to get vaccinated. So the kids can be the entry point for the family as well. So I, I think there are lots of good reasons why vaccination, when it's available, um, should be the thing that people do. You know, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. I'm one of the parents who's excited about being able to get my yeah. kids the vaccine. Um, but as it starts to get opened up, as people start to stop wearing a mask, uh, September sounds great, but it's still far away from, from now. So what do people right. like me do uh, in this interim period when we're going out and we do start to re-enter society and a lot of adults aren't wearing masks anymore? How do we make sure that our kids who don't have the opportunity to get vaccinated right now um, are safe? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think we have to continue to follow some of the successful strategies that we followed during the pandemic prior to vaccination being available. We now are pretty clear that the virus doesn't pass very easily in the outdoors. So if you're going to get, a, get together with others, do it outdoors. Uh, rather than indoors. Um, you wouldn't want to go to um, an indoor play uh, place and let a whole bunch of kids from a whole bunch of different households, a whole different bunch of different schools all get together. You try to maintain a cohort 
um, of other families where the adults and everyone around the kids are vaccinated. So the kids are relatively protected and, you know, have sort of a safe play group rather than a wide open play group. Do you think moving forward that the COVID-19 vaccine will be something that's going to be a part of the education piece uh, in making sure that students uh, get this vaccine in order to be in school. We know that that exists for other things uh, that are out there. What are your thoughts on incorporating uh, the COVID vaccine into the vaccination process for students? Well, I think currently, um, particularly since we just, we have an FDA authorization, not complete approval. And some people feel that without complete approval, we shouldn't be mandating the vaccine. I, I think there'll be some hesitance to, for now. Um, I think six months or a year from now, we'll have a lot more information about whether boosters are going to be required, whether an annual um, dose of this is going to be the norm, like flu shots. And, and if we get into that situation, I think mandating that will be really appropriate. Um, at this point, I think it's too early to say. You know, one of the things that we have seen is that many of the people in the riskiest category, those 65 and over, have received the vaccine. Um, but a lot of the younger folks who may think that it doesn't affect them so much have not gotten the vaccine. What are you seeing in terms of the new positive cases? Who's going to the hospital? Who's getting the sickest right now? Yeah, the folks that we're seeing are um, the unvaccinated. And so if it's an older person who chose not to get vaccinated, then they are part of the uh, you know the population we're seeing. Mostly, though, it is younger folks who've chosen not to get vaccinated. We we had a very high rate of vaccination in the 75 plus and the 65 plus. So we're not seeing very many of those folks sick anymore, which is great because they were at the highest risk. But we're seeing you know a reasonably steady drumbeat of uh, younger folks who are sick enough to end up in the hospital. They commonly don't stay as long as the older folks and they commonly recover, but uh, they do get sick. You know, it's hard to believe already that we're halfway through the year and uh, you folks at Hawaii Pacific Health have been working specifically on this vaccine since the beginning of the year, even going into last year. Um, with that said, there are individuals who were able to get the full vaccination uh, back in January, and it's now six months later. What are you hearing in terms of a third shot, a booster shot? Uh, do you expect that to happen? And what might that look like moving forward for those who will need to get an additional booster as we move on through this process? Yeah, this is a hot question right now, and a lot of study being done to decide whether immunity um, uh, how long immunity persists. And, and so far, we know that immunity, for those folks who really respond well to the vaccine, which is the vast majority, the immunity lasts at least six months. And in some of the study populations, they're identifying immunity still a year out. Um, that said, uh, the other issue is the variants that are popping up all over the world where the virus is still rampant. And so the question is, will the current vaccine work as well as it should for all of those variants. So far, the news has been very good, but um, the next variant, it might be very different. And so the, the decision on booster doses is going to be both whether the current vaccine covers all of the needed variants and how long does immunity last? And those two questions are the questions that will be continued to be studied until we get an answer as to, okay, now it's time for boosters. When we do boosters, then the question is, how do we manage that entire population again? You know, do we set up mass vaccination centers again? Or do we rely on the neighborhood pharmacy and your, and your, you know, your physician's office or clinic? I, I think those questions yet are to be answered as well. I, I don't know which way we're going to go on that. You know, of course, the best way to keep out the variants, we're told, is to have everybody vaccinated. So how do we, what, are, what conversations are being had in terms of uh, convincing those who may be not necessarily anti-vax, but vaccine apathetic, who just say, oh, I'll get it eventually and haven't really stepped up to the plate to get it. Um, you know, other states have done million dollar lotteries and some pretty um, robust incentives. Is there talk of doing incentives here in Hawaii? And if so, what might those look like? Yeah, I, there is talk, and I don't have any details about what they'll look like. I haven't heard that we've got any million, di million dollar prizes coming. I think that would stimulate some interest. But I, I think there are um, activities going on that hopefully will dovetail with what President Biden is doing, which is announcing this is sort of the month for a vaccination. I think the strategies we've actually been using is trying to get closer and closer to those smaller pockets of folks who just haven't found it convenient to come 
you know, to a mass vaccination center. So a lot of effort going into uh, setting up sites in the community where maybe we won't see 200 people, maybe we'll see 20, but 20 is better than not going. And so I think there's a lot of effort by the Department of Health and all the vaccination partners to try to be really clear about where a pop-up site is going to be, who they're trying to reach. Um, in On our bus, uh, sort of tour we're also finding that there are people who don't speak english and so the department of education has been great with providing some um, some of their translation uh services some folks who come and speak some of the languages of folks that we really do want to reach and so all of those different efforts about being very culturally appropriate being a you know, close by, being obvious that one of the reasons for the bus is it's pretty visible when it's there. And so people then just see it and say, oh, I can go get a shot. And whatever we can do along those lines, I think is really important. You know, one of the other side effects of COVID-19, of course, has been some of the uh, lagging ailments that many who have been infected with COVID-19 continue to face. We've heard stories of people who are being described in this category of the long haulers and who continue to face some of these uh, some debilitating uh, illnesses that continue on. What can you tell us about some of those who have had to deal with COVID-19 and are still facing some of that today? Yeah, th there's a little bit of a mix of sort of, you know, the sequelae or the after effects of COVID. So for somebody who's severely ill in the hospital, maybe on a ventilator in the ICU, um, they can take months to recover, but that's not really what we're talking about here. So there, there's that slow recovery after severe illness that's not uncommon in other illnesses as well. What we're talking about with COVID is there, there is this condition called long COVID or long hauler COVID or post COVID symptoms that um, can affect about a third, it seems, uh, in the overall population of folks who had a COVID infection. Some of those people were not sick at all. They, they knew they had COVID, so they had a few symptoms, they got tested, um, but they were probably not in the hospital. They were maybe not even very ill at all. And now, you know, months later are still dealing with being very tired or having what's called brain fog, just not being able to think as clearly as they used to before the disease. And, and so they're unable to go back to work, uh, for example. So th there are um, there's a range of symptoms. The most common is being very tired. Um, and this whole idea of brain fog, there's a whole lot of depression and anxiety among those folks as well. And um, there's no obvious treatment for the entire group. There are some selected treatments for some people and a few have found that if they then go and get vaccinated, if they haven't been vaccinated before, that they may in fact get some relief of symptoms. But there's a lot to learn about long COVID. And you know, you did mention that those folks aren't necessarily the people who present as extremely ill at the time of infection or initial infection. Are there any, you know, do, is there anything that these folks have in common? Are they a certain age? Are they, you know, one gender or the other? Do they have any pre-existing conditions? How do we know if we might be more prone to that than someone else? Yeah, it's it's actually difficult. We've got some statistics. So we know about two thirds of them are women um, compared to men. Um, it, it's Co more common in the 55 plus group, but it's still among about 20 or 25 percent of those under 35. So there, there isn't anything there that's particularly helpful. And we really can't tell who's going to get it. These are not folks who are ill before they got COVID. Um, in one study, some of them had blood, uh, high blood pressure more often than people that didn't get the syndrome, but it, there's nothing very uh, worrisome there. These are not folks who were already sick and then just have had trouble recovering. These are folks who are healthy. And this is not connected to any one variant or specific strain of COVID-19, correct? That is correct. It, it uh, has been uh, study, identified and studied since the original strains of COVID that were going around in this country a year ago. So no, it has nothing to do with variants. And when we say long COVID, how long? I mean, how, how, is, there, is there an end point for this or is this sort of just, you know, f as, as long as it takes? I think it's difficult to predict. Some people have long COVID for a month or six weeks. Others have been going for nine months or more. So um, because we don't have treatments and we don't really understand it, it's going to be uh, very individual, I think, as an experience. You know, as we go through this process, and of course there are individuals like those that we're speaking of, these long haulers that will uh, unfortunately continue to feel the impact of this. You know, there's also the large population of people that 
uh, just want to move on from anything related to COVID, yet it will likely be a part of our lives for some time. Uh, on the medical standpoint and in, in the medical community, what plans are being made to see how we address COVID-19 moving forward? Um, how is it going to be incorporated maybe into physical checkups? Will it be um, the way in which we are now just going to have to get used to getting temperature checked everywhere we go? How do you see the future uh, and what life looks like, you know, in the next year or so? Yeah, I, I think we've learned a lot since the beginning of this pandemic. So, for example, the temperature checks everywhere we go, although we're used to them, they're not actually very helpful. Um, the But it's hard to change those behaviors that we've all felt comforted by. The... Um, the real issue with COVID is that we have to just keep learning. And so, and we have to be willing to adapt as we learn. So there are huge communities of physicians of, and researchers who are working on many different aspects of what life will be like after COVID. So the long COVID, for example, um, making sure that we have all of the right protective um, sort of equipment, but understand how to use it and when to use it. Um, looking at the vaccines and whether we need boosters, so many different aspects of this um, are requiring study. And we just have to stay in tune with what the answers are and then begin to implement whatever those answers would suggest we should do. You know, I'm just curious as a physician, how you're navigating this sort of limbo that we're in as we start to approach higher thresholds of people who are vaccinated. We're obviously not at herd immunity yet, so there still is um, I don't know, this sort of waiting period, if you will. When I go out into the street, I do notice that a lot of people are still wearing their masks. And so, you know, do you go out to restaurants, for instance? How do you, how do you figure out what is safe and what are you telling patients about that? Yeah, well, I'm fortunate. I'm fully vaccinated. And so I do believe that I am quite well protected. I don't believe I'm completely protected. So if I'm in a riskier situation, such as when I travel, um, I am more careful about crowds and, you know, trying to keep my distance, wearing masks, double masking, actually, um, eye protection as well, those sorts of things, just to try to make sure that I'm limiting my exposure to sort of these unknown situations. I have been out to restaurants. I think our restaurants here in Honolulu have done a great job of, of managing um, the risk by distancing the tables and having their uh, servers in masks and such. So I think, um, the advice that I have for my patients is be tolerant of people being a little bit um, uncertain. And so if I see someone out walking, wearing a mask, and we're not wearing masks when we uh, are out there walking our dogs, we just make sure we keep six feet apart and try to, you know, respect their space and, and try not to create anxiety for others. Um, but I think in Hawaii, we're in pretty good shape. And I do agree 100% that outside we don't have to wear masks. Um, and, and so that's the behavior that I uh, talk about and I do. You know, early on in this pandemic uh, or midway through, I, I believe we had you on and, and there was that talk of uh, encouraging people to go and, and see their doctors because many people were hesitant to go to hospitals, to go into a medical facility because of the fear of COVID-19. What are you seeing now? Is that still an issue where uh, the medical community is still uh, worried about what people may be putting off uh, and not maybe getting those checkups because of COVID-19 or have things resumed as normal? I wouldn't say they've resumed as normal. They, we've seen a lot more activity in our uh, clinics and our hospitals than we were at the time we spoke before. Um, what we are seeing though is some consequences of people having put things off. And so what I would encourage is that if you've put off your mammogram or your colonoscopy or your other, your pap smear, or your cancer screenings, go on in and get those done. If you've put off, you know, checking on your blood pressure or your diabetes meds or, or those kinds of things, please go ahead and get those things done. They're, we're safe, uh, we'll take care of you well and we'll keep you safe. But I think it's really important that if people have been delaying those kinds of preventive chronic disease kinds of management, they really do need to get on it and get going because our hospitals are busy, but they're busy with um, pretty sick people who may have become sicker because they put those sorts of things off. We're approaching the top of the hour. The time always goes so quickly. We covered a lot of ground, but I want to give you an opportunity as we close out here this morning, uh, just to talk to folks who may be on the fence about getting vaccinated. What is your message to them this morning? Uh, I think the message really is, you know, you've waited now a while to, to get to comfort, to get the vaccine. And so, whatever questions you still have that would help you make that decision 
to go and get vaccinated, please ask those questions. Ask them of your own physician, ask them of another um, expert that you can find, you know, go look up what Dr. Fauci said recently. Whatever you need to make yourself comfortable to get an answer to your question. We were talking with someone at Pier 2 last week and he said his girlfriend had scared him about all sorts of bad side effects or things that she was sure were wrong with the vaccine. He came and he talked to us and then you know, gain some comfort and actually came back that later that day after work to get vaccinated. So I think seek out somebody that you trust to get the answers to your questions so that you can get yourself comfortable and get vaccinated. All right, Dr. Melinda Ashen, thank you so much for joining us from uh, Hawaii Pacific. We always appreciate you coming on, taking our questions and giving us an update on what's happening there uh, at the vaccination center and all the work that you folks do at Hawaii Pacific Health. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. Thank Aloha. you. Thank you. Great to hear from her. Very interesting. Uh, you know, as I said, I have young kids and the idea that two year olds and up could get the vaccine as early as September uh, is exciting and uh, something that we will definitely be tracking and watching. Also interesting to hear about their outreach and taking that mobile uh, clinic to all the different schools and even to some middle schools now that those over 12 and that kids are bringing their parents to say, hey, let's do this as a family. That's very encouraging. And if you're in the community, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. It's a pretty noticeable big blue bus that's going around, uh, might even attract some people to see what's going on and what it is that might help their efforts. Uh, but as she said, right now, that vaccination center at Pier 2, which was one of the, the first, if not the first to get uh, really put in place here in the state, continues to be in operation. They have scaled back in the number of personnel that are working there. As she said, they are seeing a few hundred a day. It's not the thousand, 2,000 a day that they would like to see, but as long as there's still people going that they will continue to try to find ways uh, to get that out there. Also got some great information about those long haul or COVID, you know, the long callers and, and what they're experiencing through this, their battles with COVID-19, that brain fog that she uh, speaks about. And, and really it's hard to determine who at this point will get and, and become a victim of that long-term side effects. Right, and there's no cure as far as we know. They don't know how long it lasts and you don't necessarily even have to be very sick to suffer from that months later. So uh, bottom line, if you can get vaccinated, please do because obviously that is the best way for us to get out of this and to avoid any of those issues that she talked about. We loved having her on. It's really interesting from, to hear from her. Um, you know, she's, she's the best of the best and we appreciate her time this morning. Um, uh, on fr on Friday, we've got another interesting guest. We're switching gears. We're going to be talking about HPD. That's right. We're going to be speaking with a member on the Honolulu Police Commission. Uh, of course, they are uh, in the light right now. They are responsible for helping to select who will be taking over Chief Susan Ballard's position. Uh, they are in the process right now of hiring a new police chief and going through some of the criteria and specifications that this commission would like to see. And so we're going to be diving a little deeper into that. Of course, there has been uh, no doubt a lot of crime that has been happening, making headlines, uh, stabbing in Waikiki that happened earlier this week and, and just a string of police violence as well. And so we want to get an update from uh, the commission as well as uh, those who are in charge of making this decision of what characteristics they're looking for in the next police chief. Yeah, so we do hope they'll join us 1030 on Friday. Until then, stay safe and we'll see you right back here on Friday. Aloha. Aloha.